scent was very strong indeed. I reckon half an hour ago. I blacked out for a while. Them shots snapped me out of it. Before the boy had finished speaking, Bane and Rourke slipped away to the edge of the clearing, cutting for sign. Rourke whistled and everyone but Horn hustled over. Just beyond a deadfall, he'd found a well-beaten footpath. Their missing comrades had passed this way, and so had at least two others. Bane swore and cut a plug of chaw and jammed it in his mouth. He swore again and spat. The four held a brief discussion and decided there might be trouble ahead, so caution was advised. Miller would help Horn back to camp while the rest went on to find Calhoun and Ma. Horn got to his feet and joined them, visibly shaking off his unsteadiness. Like hell! Ma is my boy. I'm going. Fine, Stephen said. Moses, you lead the way. And the men proceeded along the path single file. The going was much easier than before as the path lay a few feet from the ridgeline and the hills, while steep were much gentler than before. Ten minutes later they came to a fork at the base of a dead red cedar. The bowl of the cedar would have required four or five men to link hands to span its girth. It had sheared off at about the eighty-foot mark. One fork of the trail continued along the ridge. The other descended into the valley, which was still mostly hidden by forest. Boot prints went both directions. But Bane and Rourke were confident their friends had traveled in the valley. Bane sniffed the air, then gestured downward. Wood smoke. Sure enough, Miller said, just then winding the tang of smoke. They proceeded only a few paces when he happened to look back and stopped with a hiss of warning to his companions. What is it? Stephen said. That tree, Miller said indicating a blaze mark on the downhill face of the big, dead cedar. A stylized ring, broken on the sinister side. The symbol was roughly four feet across and gouged in a good three inches. Someone had daubed it in a thick reddish paint, now bled and mostly absorbed by the wood. It appeared petrified with age. Some inherent quality of the ring caused Miller's flesh to crawl. The light seemed to dim, the forest to close in. Nobody said anything. Stevens produced a small spyglass and swept the area. He muttered and tossed the glass to Bane. Bane looked around. He passed it to Ruark. Finally, he swore and handed the glass back. Stevens, in turn, let Miller have a go. Stevens said, I make out three more. There, there, and there. He was correct. Miller spotted the other trees scattered along the hillside. Each was huge and dead, and each bore the weird glyph. I seen that mark afore, Bain said in a reverential whisper. That book, Miller said. And Bain grunted. Miller asked for Stephen's jug, hooked the handle with his pinky, mountain man fashion and took a long, stout pull of the whiskey until black stars shot across his vision. Then he gasped for air and helped himself to another, healthier swig. Jesus, Stephen said when he finally retrieved his hooch. He shook the jug with a sad, amazed expression, as if not quite comprehending how this could have happened to his stock. I don't cotton to this tall, Horn said. He rubbed the goose egg on his forehead. He was flower pale. I'm with the pup, Bain said. He spat. Rourke grunted agreement. He too spat a gob of Virginia pride into the shrubbery. Stevens crept up to the cedar and studied it intently. Ran his fingers over the rough bark, he said. Damn it all! Boys, looky here! As everyone clustered around, he showed them how a great chunk of bark was separate from the tree. The slab of bark was as tall as three men, narrowing to a sharp peak. The outline, as of a door, was clear once they discerned it against the pattern. The bark door was hinged with sinew on one side. What do you reckon it is? Horn said, backing away. 
Watching Stevens trace the panel in search of a catch caused Miller's anxiety to sharpen. The light was fading and far too early in the afternoon. The sun's edge was being rapidly eaten by a black wave, creating a broken ring of fire and shadow. This phenomenon juxtaposed with a broken ring carved in the tree. Miller said, Don't, boys. Just leave it. Stevens muttered his satisfaction at locating the catch. Bane and Stevens pulled the wooden panel three-quarters of the way open and then stopped, bodies rigid as stone. From his vantage, Miller couldn't make out much of the hollow, gloomy interior, but the other two men stood with their necks craned and Bane moaned, low and aggrieved, as a fellow who'd been stabbed in the gut. Sweet Lord in heaven, Stephen said. Miller took several broad steps to join them at the portal. He gazed within and saw... Something squirmed and uncoiled, a darker piece of darkness, and resolved into... His vision clouded violently and he staggered, as steadied by Ruark while Bane and Stephen sealed the panel, ramming it closed with their shoulders. They spun, faces white, wearing expressions of fear that were terrible to behold in men of such stern metal. Good God, look at the sky, Horn said. The moon occulted the sun and the world became a shadowy realm where every surface glowed and bloomed with a queer bluish-white light. Every living thing in the forest held its breath. Jesus, Mother Mary, Rourke said, breaking the spell. Jesus, Mother Mary Christ Almighty. And the men scrambled, tripped and staggered, grasping at branches to keep their footing. The eclipse lasted four minutes at most. The group reached the bottom as the moon and the sun slid apart, and the world brightened by degrees. The valley was narrow and ran crookedly north and south. There were falls to the north, and a small, shallow river wound its way through sandbars and intermittent stands of cottonwood and fallen spars and uprooted trunks. A rustic village lay 170 or so yards distant upon the opposite side of the valley behind a low palisade of vertical logs, a collection of antique cottages and bungalows that extended as far as the middle heights of the terraced hillside. Several figures moved along the buildings, tending to chickens, hanging clothes. Stevens passed the scope around, and it was confirmed that a handful of women were the only visible inhabitants. Miller had marched similar villages in the European countryside where the foundations might be centuries old, perhaps dated from medieval times. To encounter such a place here, in the wilds of North America, was incomprehensible. This town was wrong, utterly wrong, and the valley one of the hidden places of the world. He'd never heard a whisper of the community and only God knew why people would dwell in secret. Perhaps they belonged to a religious sect that had fled persecution and wished to follow their faith in peace. He thought of the dreadful music from the previous night, the ominous drums, the blackening sun, and was not reassured. Away from the central portion of the community loomed a stone tower with a crenellated parapet, surmounted by a turret of shiny clay shingles that narrowed to a spike. The tower rose to a height of four stories, dominating the village and was constructed of bone-white stone notched at intervals by keyhole windows. The broken ring symbol that had been painted in black ochre to the left of every window and upon the great iron-bound oak doors at the tower's base. As with the symbol of the ring carved into the tree on the hillside, some combination of elements imbued the tower with menace that struck a chord deep inside Miller. His heart quickened, and he looked over his shoulder at the way they'd come. Be dark soon, Stephen said. He also cast a furtive backward glance. Long shadows spread over the rushes and the open ground before them. The bloody sun hung a finger's breadth above the peaks, and the sky was turning to rust. These folks might be dangerous. Keep your guns ready. Horn snatched at Bane's sleeve. 
What do y'all see back there? Shut it, boy. Ain't gonna leave this valley going in that direction. Nothing more to tell. Yeah, shut it, Rourke said, and gave the kid a shove to get him moving. The company forded the river where it rushed shin-deep and moved to the village and passed through the open gate of the palisade after Stevens hailed the occupants. A dozen women of various ages paused in their chores and silently regarded the visitors. The women wore long, simple dresses of a distinctly Quaker style and dour bonnets and kerchiefs. They appeared well-fed and clean. Their teeth were white. Several of them immediately repaired to the central structure, a kind of longhouse. Most of the others went into the smaller houses. One of the younger girls smiled furtively at Miller. Obviously, she was simple. Her dress was cut low and revealed her buxom curves. Her belly swollen with child, and Miller blushed and turned his head away. Chickens pecked in the weeds. A couple of goats wandered around, and a small pack of mutts approached, yipping and snaffling at the men's legs. A brawny matron with gray hair stepped forward to greet the company, and she, too, offered a friendly smile. Hello, strangers. Welcome. Her accent and mannerism seemed off-kilter, indefinably foreign. Begging your pardon, ma'am. Stephen stuffed his hat, clutched it nervously. Our apologies to intrude and all, but we're on the trail of a couple old boys who belong to our group. We're hoping you might have seen them. His voice shook, and he and Bane continued to cast worried glances over their shoulders. For his part, Miller had spent the past few minutes convincing himself he'd seen a coon or porcupine in the dead tree, maybe a drowsing black bearer. To further distract and calm his galloping imagination, he studied the lay of the land. The houses were made of smoothed rocks and mortared stone, and the windows were tiny and mostly without glass, protected from the elements by means of thick drapes and shutters. The dirt paths were grooved and hardened to iron with age. The hillside climbed steeply through trees and undergrowth, although its face was mostly rock. A cave mouth opened beneath an overhang. He thought perhaps some eccentric industrialist had possibly created a replica of a medieval town and transplanted its citizens, but the closer he inspected it, the more its atmosphere seeped into him, and he understood this was something far stranger. The matron apparently observed the tension among the loggers. She said, Dear gentlemen, ye have nothing to fear. Be at peace. We're not afraid, missus, Miller said. He used a gruff tone because the woman unnerved and unsettled him with her odd accents, her antiquated primness, the manner in which she cocked her head like a living doll, how the whites of her eyes were overcome by black. But we are in a powerful hurry. The men will soon return from the gathering, and ye shall treat with them. Until then, please rest. The matron waved them towards some benches near the statue of a figure in robes. Two children of equally indeterminate sex crouched at its feet. The statue was defaced by weather and green mold. One grotesquely elongated hand stretched forth, as if to part a curtain to reveal some dark mystery. The children's necks were cruelly bent, tongues distended. Spines humped and exposed as if flayed by a butcher's knife. The larger figure's dangling hand caressed their bowed heads. Girls, see to fetching our guests pie and lemonade. The two younger women disappeared into the longhouse, as did the one who'd smiled at Miller. They moved with the ponderous grace of soon-to-be mothers. Miller wondered if all the girls were with child, and wished he'd paid more attention. It seemed important. He said to the matron, How did you come to build this village? It's not on any maps. Isn't it? The woman said, and for an instant, her smile became sly as a predator of the wood. Our hamlet is very old, and 
was carried across the sea by our founders when Sir Raleigh still served the Queen's pleasure. This is a place of worship, of communion, and far, far from wicked civilizations of men. The nights are long in this valley. The days are gloomy. It is perfect. Stevens wrung his hat and fidgeted. If you don't mind, ma'am, we need to locate our friends and be on our way before the sun goes down. Could you kindly point the way? Tracks show they come through here. You saw them, of course, Miller said. He decided what it was about the woman's speech that bothered him. Her voice was hoarse. The cadences unbalanced. Her intonation stilted because she wasn't accustomed to speaking and hadn't been for a long time. Aye, she's seen them all right, Bane said, mouth set in a grim line. Probably one of you wenches that lured him here. The matron kept smiling. Her hands trembled. Our husbands will be home anon. Mayhap they have seen your companions. She turned and walked into the longhouse. The door closed and then came the unmistakable clunk of a bar dropping. Bane shook his head and spat. He broke apart his rigby and checked the load and clacked the breech into place again. Well, this ain't good, Stephen said. Horn said, What we aiming to do? He moved to shuck his pack and Rourke frowned and told him to leave it be. Gotta find Cal and Ma, that's what. And leave your goddamn pack on. We have to make tracks in a hurry. You want to be all the way up shit creek with no paddle? Stevens clapped his hat on. Stick our noses in every last house. Kick in the doors if we have to. Let's make it quick. Daylight is burning. Miller and Bane teamed to search the cottages on the south side. Stevens, Horn, and Rourke took the north. It went fast. Miller took the lead, busting through the doors and making a brief sweep of the interiors. The women inside calmly waited, speaking not a word to the trespassers, and indeed many were pregnant. Each house was small and dim, but there weren't many places to hide. Most were neat and well-ordered, not untoward in any obvious way. Simple furnishings, albeit archaic. Oil lamps and candles, fireplaces that doubled as ovens, a paltry selection of books on rude shelves. This last detail struck him as truly odd. He said to Bane, That one Bible... You ever see this many houses without a copy or two of the good book lying around? Bane shrugged and allowed as he hadn't witnessed that particular phenomenon either. Both parties finished within a few minutes and regrouped in the square. Everyone was sweating from running up the hill to check the half-dozen houses perched there. Miller mentioned the lack of holy literature. Stephen said, Yeah, mighty peculiar. Where are the kids? You seen any? Good damn, Horn said. Rats should be crawling underfoot, chasing the chickens, screaming bloody murder. Something sure as hell ain't right. Maybe they ain't inside the big house, Rurik said. Or that tower. Well, we gotta check that house, Miller said, although the idea made him unhappy. The thought of searching the tower was even worse. It curved out of joint, angles distorted and the sight made his head queer, his stomach ill, not the tower if there were any other way. Horn appeared stricken. Hold on there, fellas. Them women ain't gonna hold Cal or Ma. No, sir. We barge in there and get shot. Some might say we had it coming. Yeah, I reckon, Stephen said. You can stay out here and keep watch if you're afraid of the ladies. Them husbands gonna be walking in on us any minute. Who knows how many of them old boys will show? Plenty, you can wager, Bane said. Miller kicked the door. Solid as a stump, he said. Rourke spat and unlimbered his axe, as did Bane a moment later. The pair stood shoulder to shoulder, chopping at the door and it crashed inward after a few blows. The men piled into the house, blinking against the smoky dimness. The sole light came from what seeped through window notches and a guttering fire in the hearth. The murk made hazy blobs at the long table. 
the counter and barrels stacked in threes here and there. The peak roof vaulted to a height of fifteen or so feet, supported by a massive center beam and a series of angled joists that met the wall at about chin level. Meat hooks, pots and pans, coils of rope, cured ham, and strings of sausage swayed and rustled with each gentle exhalation from the hearth. Of the women there was no sign. But Ma was present. Miller almost cried out when he beheld what had been done to the Welshman, and Stevens hollered loud enough to burst an eardrum. Miller didn't blame him. Ma sat, Indian style, naked in the middle of the floor, blood thick as pudding around his legs. In his lap, his belly was sliced wide and a quivering rope of purple innards was strung several feet above him and looped through a large eye bolt suspended from a chain. The intestines traveled down again like a pulley cable and wrapped around a wooden turnstile. Turnstile had been cranked repeatedly, and its gory yarn oozed and leaked. Most of the rest of Ma's guts were slopped across his thighs, or floating in the gru. His slack jaw drooled. He gave his comrades a glassy-eyed nod not much different than his usual. Oh, God, Ma, Stephen said. What'd they do to you, Hoss? Horn stuck his head in to see what the commotion was all about and shrieked to beat the band, so Ruark swatted him with his hat and drove him outside. Right then the matron ghosted from the gloom in the corner and hacked Bane's shoulder with a cleaver. He yelled and smacked her in the jaw with the butt of his rigby as she sprawled. Blood trickled from the matron's lips. The injury did not diminish her rather imbued her with an aura of savagery and mania that caused the men to flinch as one might from a wounded beast. Her eyes were so very large and dark, and they gleamed with tears of rage and exultation. She whispered with the intimacy of a lover, Did you see what's waiting for ye in the trees? Where's our other man? Miller strode over to the matron and leveled his rifle at her. I'll blow a damned hole in your kneecap, missus. See if I won't. No need for that. The handsome lad is in the tower. They gave us the fat one for sport. It amuses them to watch us practice cruelty. Miller walked around Ma and the coagulating lake of blood. He grasped the ring of a trapdoor and pulled. Several of the women were huddled like goats in a root cellar. They gasped and held each other. See him? Stephen said. Miller slammed the trap door and shook his head. Bane cussed as Ruark pulled the cleaver free of his shoulder with a grisly crunch. Miller fashioned a tourniquet. The entire left side of Bane's buckskin jacket was soaked through and dripping. Horn shouted. Everyone ran to the windows. Twilight lay upon the world and a disjointed chain of lamps bobbed in the purple dark descending the switchback trail on the other side of the valley. Miller said, Either we ford up, or we run for it. Stephen said, Trapped like rats in here. Roof is made of wood. They could burn us alive. Not with they women in here, Bane said through gritted teeth. You want to spend the night in here with them? Miller said. Yeah, never mind. We could take this one as a hostage. Stephen said half-heartedly. Piss on that, Miller said. Who knows what'll she chop off next time? He should flee into the hills, the matron said. The horrors ye will soon meet. Flee, good hunters, or make an end of each other with your guns and knives. Twill be a merciful death in comparison. Shut up before I kill you, Miller said. The matron stopped talking at once. What about Ma? Stephen said. He's gone, Bane said. Worst way a man can go, gutted like a pig. We can't leave him. No, we can't. Rourke drew his flintlock pistol. He walked over and laid the barrel against the back of Ma's head and squeezed the trigger. For Miller, in that moment, the past five years of his life were erased 
and he side-slipped through time and space into a muddy trench in France, shells and bodies exploding. He had never left, never escaped. Stevens aimed his rifle at the matron. He lowered it. Don't have the sand to shoot no woman. Let's get boys, Ruick said. We won't make it far in these woods in the dark, Stephen said. We head for the tower and fetch Cal, see what happens. The matron said, Yes, yes, go into the house of the master. He'll greet ye with a glad smile and open arms. Quiet yourself, hag, Stephen said, menacing her with his rifle butt. Come on, boys, let's find poor Cal before the villains make stew of him. There was grudging acquiescence to this plan, and the men withdrew from the longhouse and its horrors. Miller went to the palisade gate and shouldered the infield, aimed at the string of lights and blasted several rounds in rapid succession. One of the approaching lamps burst. The rest were doused momentarily. A howl of pain rose from the field. Miller reloaded in a hurry. He ran for the tower where his companions were gathered near its double doors. Something fluttered to his left, a coattail disappearing behind a pile of neatly stacked firewood. He knew they'd been had. While the villagers waving lanterns on the flats played decoy, others had crept along in a flanking action. He dropped to a knee and swung his rifle around. Ambush! Bane hollered, as a dozen or more men in coats and top hats sprang from behind sheds, cottages, hay bales, seemingly everywhere. Pitchforks, hatchets, and knives, edges gleaming and glinting. A couple carried blunderbusses, bulkier and older than even Rourke's. Those guns cracked and spat fire. Puffs of sulfurous white smoke boiled and seethed. Ten feet away, Bane let loose both barrels of the Rigby with a clap of thunder that sounded as if Archangel Michael himself had descended from heaven to smite the good lord's enemies. The muzzle flash lit up the tower courtyard like a rocket explosion. A villager was cut in half, and a section of the cottage wall behind him caved in, stumped by an elephant. The other loggers loosed a fusillade in a murderous fireworks display. Night vision spoiled by the alternating glare and shadow, Miller struggled to find targets. He didn't have the opportunity to draw a bead, but simply emptied the end field as fast as he could work the bolt. Most of his bullets clattered off stone or ripped furrows into the earth. However, he shot one bearded brute between the eyes as the man charged with an upraised hatchet and drilled another in the back as the fellow stood motionless, as if uncertain how to join the fray. The cottage that Bane had perforated with his gun caught fire. Flames leaped into the sky. Glass tinkled as it fractured. The fire spread to another house, then another, and in less than thirty seconds, the combatants were struggling by the red blaze of a circle in hell. Ruark swung his axe and lopped a villager's head. The head floated past Miller and into the blaze. Bane screamed and laughed, his beard splattered with blood. He pressed a man's face against a flaming timber and held it there until flesh popped and sizzled. Horn dropped his rifle and turned to run. An older gent in a stovepipe hat knocked him down and skewered him with a pitchfork. The pitchfork went in with a meaty thunk and a clink as the tines bit through into the dirt. Horn grabbed the handle and wrestled for dear life as the man grunted, planted his boot against Horn's groin, and pried loose the pitchfork and raised it to stick him again. Then Rorik's axe whacked the back of the villager's skull and turned it to jelly, and the man collapsed face down legs twitching. Stephen's rifle boomed once, twice, and it cursed and drew a knife and sidled in tight with his companions. Miller was empty. He picked up a severed hand and forearm and threw it in a man's face, then shoulder-blocked him to the ground and methodically clubbed him to death with his rifle butt. Sweat and grease and flying drops of blood soaked him. Miller's arms were weak, and he could scarcely raise them at the end. A blast of heat from the burning house has seared his cheeks and ignited the tips of his hair. The smell of roasting flesh was strong. The remaining villagers routed, fleeing through the flames and the rolling black smoke. Bane, still braying mad laughter, chucked a tomahawk. It sank into a man's backside. 
The man yelped and stumbled. Bane whooped and said, Run, you fucking dogs! And he barked. There's reinforcements yonder. Stevens and Rourke grasped Horn under the arms and dragged him to his feet. The lad gasped and fainted. Rifles thundered near the front gate. A musket ball kicked dirt near Miller's foot. Follow me, boys! He led the charge up the hill and into the cave along a twisting path illuminated by the hellish conflagration. Storming the tower was out of the question. He suspected it would burn to the ground soon enough. Regardless, anyone trapped inside would be smoked out or broiled alive. The cave mouth opened into a low-ceilinged area with a sandy floor and natural outcroppings that served as adequate cover. The men quickly repurposed empty barrels and busted timbers to fashion a makeshift barricade at the entrance. After they'd finished effecting hasty fortifications, Stevens passed around the remnants of his bottle. He said, We're in it deep. Killed us a few, but I count twenty, maybe more. Probably mad as hornets over what we done. Learn us something we don't know, boy, Bane said, between blood loss and one too many belts of rot gut to kill the pain. He slurred, listing precariously until Ruark helped him sit against the wall. Below, several houses were utterly consumed in the inferno, and the fire made a sound like rushing wind. Sparks ignited the lower branches of nearby trees. The smoke had become so thick it proved difficult to discern the movements of the villagers. Men darted about with buckets, presumably hurling dirt and water on the flames. Miller went flat and laid the Enfield across his rolled jacket. He waited, inhaled, partially exhaled, and squeezed the trigger. A lucky shot. A villager's arms flew from his sides and he toppled and lay in the dirt. One hand extended into a burning pile of wood, and soon his clothes smoked and flames licked over them. The rest of the villagers made themselves scarce. The fire spread swiftly after that. Horn moaned and twisted on the ground. He prayed for Jesus, marrying God. Miller helped Rourke peel aside the boy's shirt and slid his hand under his body and felt around. The tines had indeed gone clean through, and Horn leaked like a sieve. It wouldn't be long. He caught Rourke's glance and shook his head slightly. Rourke spat. Boy didn't even fire that pea shooter of his. Bastards. Horn cried for his mama. Hush, Stephen said, striking a match and lighting a lamp he'd found on a peg. He hung the lamp from a support timber in the back of the cave where it constricted to a narrow passage that descended into absolute darkness. Miller couldn't determine the purpose of the cave. Although moderately carved and shored, it wasn't a mine. Occult symbols had been chalked upon the walls. Stick figures bowed and scraped, dwarfed by what appeared to be a huge bundle of twigs. Not twigs. Worms, or something squiggly like worms. Huddled around the lamp, the loggers resembled characters from some gothic fable. Resurrection men leaning on spades at midnight in a swampy graveyard. By that primitive oil lamplight, the company was a horrific, blood-soaked mess. They piled their packs and sundries in the middle of the floor and counted ammunition and rations. Wounds were appraised. Bane's hacked shoulder would be the death of him without medicine. Rourke had gotten hit in the belly. The hole was about the size of a bean and welt purple, and it bubbled when he took a breath. The black powder ball was still inside, although the old logger shrugged and spat and said he felt fine as frog's hair. Stevens revealed nasty punctures in his thigh and ribs, a vicious slash across his breast. Only Miller had survived the melee unscathed. What? None of that blood you're covered in is yours? Not even a scratch, you lucky bastard. Stevens threw back his head and laughed as Rourke helped wind strips of cloth around his torso to staunch the bleeding. Miller didn't say anything. He'd never taken more than a few bumps and bruises. The occasional cut from flying shrapnel during the war had literally walked through the apocalypse at Bellow Wood untouched. Stevens made a fire pot by slathering beer grease in a tin cup. 
and lighting a strip of cloth for a wick. He and Rourke proposed to scout the tunnel and make certain nobody was sneaking along their back trail. That left Miller with the kid, who was unconscious and raving, and Bane, who appeared to also have one foot in the grave. The wait proved short, however. Stevens and Bane reappeared, wide-eyed as horses who'd been spooked by fire. Rourke tossed loose timber and small rocks in the tunnel opening. Stevens reported that the caves stretched on and on and branched every few paces. In his estimation, anybody damn fool enough to venture into that labyrinth would be wandering for eternity. After a long, whispered conference, it was decided the men would wait until daylight and then make a run for Slango. There was no telling when or if McGrath might deign to send a search party so it was safest to assume they were on their own. Watches were set, with Rourke taking the first, as he allowed he couldn't sleep anyhow. He snuffed the lamp and the fire pot, and they settled in to wait. Stephen said, Ever wonder what Rumpelstiltskin wanted with a kid? Miller pulled his hat down and tried to relax. An eldritch white radiance illuminated the cave, and it was just him and Horn. Everyone else melted and vanished. Mist flowed from the passage and curled over the pile of packs, swirled over Horn's chest and around Miller's knees. Horn stared. His face was gray, suspended in the mist. He said, Come on, tell me true. What'd y'all see in that tree? What was hiding up in there? Worms, Miller said. He wasn't certain if this was accurate. The memory slipped and slithered and changed when he tried to examine it closely. A fibrous network of slimy roots or worms or a mass of tendrils squirming in the moist dark of the mighty cedar bowl. They had faces. Demons sleep in holes in the ground. Live in the rocks. Sleep in the big old trees in the deep forest where the sun don't never shine. Oh... Horn nodded. I don't know what the little man in the story wanted with the child, but I can tell you the villagers give their babies to their friends inside the trees, inside this mountain, the sons and daughters of old Leech. And I can tell you what the people of old Leech do with them. I'd rather you didn't. Just shut your eyes and look inside. We so close. You can see their god. He's sleepy like a bear in winter, dreaming of his people. Dreaming of us here in the daylight, too. But he's waking up. Be creeping out of his den pretty soon, I reckon. Save it, kid. He loves his people. Loves us, too, in a different way. Horn's smile was shrewd and cruel. He opened his mouth and inhaled the peculiar light and Miller's dreams became confused. He dreamt of falling through the mountain, through the entire earth, and into the sky, accelerating like a bullet until the light of the sun dwindled to a pinprick, crashed through the icy, blood-black surface of a strange moon, and drifted weightless in its hollow core. The cavern was rank and humid and dark as pitch, he floated over crags and canyons and forests of clabbered flesh and fungus. His body carried upon the updrafts of a warm, gelatinous sea. At the center of this sea, a mountain range shuddered and stirred. The colossus writhed and uncoiled with satanic majesty. Aroused by the whine of flea wings, it whispered to him. Miller awoke to Calhoun begging for help. Calhoun cried from the direction of the tower. He called them by name in a tone of anguish and his voice carried. He began screaming the screams of a man partially buried alive or hung in barbed wire or swollen with mustard gas. Miller lay in the shadows, watching the dying light of the fires shiver across the wall of the cave. Calhoun kept screaming and they all pretended not to hear him. Still later, and after night settled in as tight as a blindfold, Stevens shook Miller, 
Something's wrong. Oh, jumping Jesus, Ruach said, and moments later lighted the fire pot. Miller would have cursed the old man for revealing their position, except he saw the cause of alarm. Horn was gone, spirited away from under their noses. Drips and drabs of blood smeared into the tunnel, into the blackness. Them sons of bitches snatched that! As if in response to the light, a faint, ghostly moan echoed up the passage from great subterranean depths. Help me, boys. Help me. At least that's what it sounded like to Miller. The distance and acoustics could have made wind whistling through chimneys of rock resemble almost anything. Lordy, lordy, Bane said. It was a frightful sight. Gore limed his beard and jacket. He might have been a talking corpse. That's the boy. Ain't him, Stephen said. It is done for, Miller said. His eyes watered and he struggled to keep his voice even. Whoever's hooting down that tunnel is no friend of ours. Please right, Moses, Rourke said. This an old engine trick. Make a noise of a wounded friend and draw you in. He ran his thumb across his throat with an exaggerated flourish. You should know it, Hoss. That boy is dead. Look at all the blood, Stephen said. Bain shoved a plug of tobacco into his mouth and chewed with his eyes closed. His flesh was papery, and his eyelids fluttered the way a man's do when he's caught in a terrible dream. He resembled the photographs of dead outlaws in open coffins displayed on frontier boardwalks. He spat. Yeah, and look at me. Still kicking. Help me. Help me. The four of them froze like woodland animals, heads inclined toward the dim cries, the cold, cold draft. Ain't him, Stevens repeated, but mostly to himself. Bane stood. He leaned against the wall, the barrel of his rigby nosing the sand. He nodded to Rourke. You coming? Rourke spat. He lifted the fire pot and led the way. Bane said, All righty, boys. Take care. He tapped his hat and limped after his comrade. Their shadows swayed and jostled, and their light grew smaller and seeped into the mountain and was gone. The others sat in the dark for a long time, listening. Miller heard faint laughter, a snatch of Bane singing, John Brown's body, and then only the fluting of the wind in the rocks. Oh, hell, Stephen said, when the silence between them had gone on for an age. You was in the war. You weren't? Uh-uh. My father worked for the post office. He fixed my card so as I wouldn't get conscripted. Wish I'd thought of that, Miller said. You've seen the worst of it. Any chance we can get out of this with our skins? Nope. There was another long pause. Stephen said, Wanna smoke? He lighted two old mills and passed one to Miller. They smoked and listened, but there was nothing to hear except for the wind. The rustle of branches outside, Stephen said. He weren't dragged. The kid crawled away. How do you figure? He was pretty much dead. Pretty much ain't the same thing now, is it? I heard him talking to him, whispering from the dark. Only heard bits. Didn't need more. They told him to come ahead, and he did. Must have been persuasive, Miller said. And you didn't raise the alarm. Hard to explain. Snake bit, frozen stiff. It was like my body fell asleep, yet I could hear what was going on. I was piss scared. Miller smoked his cigarette. I don't blame you, he said. I got my senses back after a piece. Kid was long gone by then. Whoever they are, he went with them. And now Moses and Ruark are with them, too. I didn't tell the whole truth about what we saw in the tunnel. Is that so? Didn't see much point carrying on. 
Not far along the trail, it opens into a cavern. Dunno how big. Our light couldn't touch but the edges of the walls and the ceiling. There were drops into plain old nothing and more passages twisting every which way, but we stopped only a few steps into the cavern. A pillar rose high as the light could reach, broad at the base like a pyramid and made of rocks all slippery and shiny from dripping water, except the rocks weren't just rocks. There were skeletons cemented in between, probably hundreds and hundreds, small things. There was a hole at eye level, smooth as the bore of my gun and about the size of my fist. Pure black, solid, glistening black that threw the light from our torch back at us. We didn't peep too close on account of the skeletons before we turned tail and ran. Saw one thing as we turned to haul our asses. That hole had widened enough. I could have jumped in and stood tall. It made a sound that traveled from somewhere farther and deeper than I want to think about. Not the kind of sound you hear, but the kind you feel in your bones. Felt kind of bad and good at once. I could tell Ruark liked it. Oh, he was afraid, but compelled, I guess you'd say. Well... Miller said after consideration. I can see why you might have kept that to yourself. Yeah, I wish them old coons had stayed back. Maybe we could have blasted our way out with their guns and ours. Miller didn't think so. Maybe. Catch some shut-eye. Sun up in a couple hours. Stevens rolled over and set his hat over his face and didn't move again. Miller watched the stars fade. They left the cave at dawn and descended the hill into the ruins of the village. Ashes turned in the breeze. The tower stood. Although scorched and blackened, its double doors were sprung, wood smoldering, hinges melted. Smoke curled from the gap. Many of the surrounding houses had burned to their foundations. Gray dust lay over everything. Corpses were stacked near the longhouse and covered with a canvas tarp to keep the birds away. Judging from height and width of the collection, at least fifteen bodies were piled beneath the tarp awaiting burial. Twenty-five to thirty men and women combed the charred wreckage. Their hands and faces were filthy in the gray dust. Some stared hatefully at the pair. But none spoke. None raised a hand. Miller and Stevens trudged through the village and onward, following the river south as it wended through the valley. With every step, Miller's shoulders tightened as he awaited the inevitable musket ball to shear his spine. Early in the afternoon, they climbed a bluff and rested for the first time. After Stevens caught his breath, he said, I don't understand. Why'd they let us live? He removed his hat and peered through the trees, searching for signs of pursuit. Did they? Miller said. He didn't look the way they'd come. Instead, studying the forest depths before them, tasting the damp and the rot and the cold, he thought of his dream of flying into the depths of space, of the terrible darkness between the stars and what ruled there. We've got nowhere to hide, I had to guess. I'd guess they're saving us for something very special. So they continued on and arrived at the outskirts of Slango as the peaks darkened to purple. Nothing remained of the encampment except for abandoned logs and mucky, flattened areas, and a muddle of footprints and drag marks. Every man, woman, and mule was gone. Every piece of equipment likewise vanished. The railroad tracks had been torn up. In a few months, Forrest would reclaim all but the shorn slopes, erasing any evidence Slango Camp ever stood there. Shit, Stephen said without much emotion. He hung his hat on a branch and wiped his face with a bandana. Hello, lads, a man said, stepping from behind a tree. He was wide and portly and wore a stovepipe hat and an immaculate silk suit. His handlebar mustache was luxuriously waxed, 
and he carried a blackthorn cane in his left hand. A dying ray of sun glowed upon the white, white skin of his face and neck. I am Dr. Boris Kalamov. You have caused me a tremendous amount of trouble. He gestured at the surroundings. This is not our way. We prefer peaceful coexistence. To remain unseen and unheard, suckling like a hagfish. Our hosts none the wiser, albeit dimly cognizant, through the persistent legends and campfire tales which please us and nourish us as much as blood and bone. To act with such dramatic flourish goes against our code, our very nature. Alas, certain of my brethren were taken by a vengeful mood, what with you torching the village of our servants. He tisked and wagged a finger that seemed to possess too many joints. Miller didn't even bother to lift his rifle. He was focused upon the nightmare taking shape in his mind. How now, doctor? Stevens was more optimistic, or just doggedly belligerent. He jacked around into the chamber of his Winchester and sighted the man's chest. Dr. Kalimov smiled and his mouth dripped black. You arrived at a poor time, friends. The black of the sun, the villagers' holiest of holy days, when they venerate the great dark, and we who call it home. Their quaint and superstitious ceremony at the dolmen cut short because of your trespass. Such an interruption merits pain and suffering. Oh, men from Porlock, it shan't end well for you. Stevens glanced around, peering into the shadows of the trees. I figured you didn't come for tea, fancy pants. What I want to know is what happens next. You will dwell among my people, of course. Where? You mean in the village? No, oh, no, no, not the village with your kind. The cattle who breed our delicacies and delights. No, you shall dwell in the dark with us where the rest of your friends from this lovely community were taken last night while you two cowered in the cave. You're a wily and resourceful fellow, Mr. Stevens, as are most of your doughty woodsmen keen. We can make use of you. Wonderful, wonderful use. Goodbye, you son of a bitch. Stephen said, cocking the hammer. Not quite, Dr. Kalimov said. If we can't have you, we'll simply make do with your relatives. Your father still works for the post office in Seattle, does he not? And your sweet mother needs and has supper ready when he gets home to that cozy farmhouse you grew up in near Green Lake. Your little brother, Buddy, working on the railroad in Nevada. Your nephews, Curtis and Kevin, are riding the range in Wyoming. So many miles of fence to mend. So little time. Very dark on the prairie at night. Perhaps you would rather we visit them instead. Stevens lowered his rifle, then dropped it in the mud. He walked to the doctor and stood beside him, slumped and defeated. Dr. Kalimov patted his head. The doctor's hand was large enough to have encompassed it if he'd wished, and his nails were as long as darning needles. He flicked Stephen's ear, and it peeled loose and plopped wetly in the bushes. Stephen's clapped his hand over the hole and screamed and fell to his knees, Blood streaming between his fingers. Dr. Kalimov smiled an avuncular smile and tousled the man's hair. He pushed a nail through the top of Stephen's skull and wiggled. Stevens fell silent, his face slack and dumb. 
as Ma's had ever been. Reckon I'll decline your offer, Miller said. He drew his pistol and weighed it in his hand. Go ahead and terrorize my distant relations. Meanwhile, I think I'll blow my brains out and be shut of this whole mess. Don't be hasty, young man, Dr. Kalamov said. I've taken a shine to you. You're free to leave this mountain. There is a lockbox in the roots of that tree. The company payroll. Take it. Take a new name. And when you're old, be certain to tell of the horrors that you've seen. Horrors that will infest your dreams from today until the day you die. We'll always be near you, Mr. Miller. He doffed his hat and bowed. Then he grasped Stevens by the collar and bundled him under one arm and into the gathering gloom. The lockbox was where the man had promised, and it contained a princely sum. Miller stuffed the money in a sack as the sun went down, and darkness fell. When he'd finished packing the money, he buried his head in his arms and groaned. By the way, there are two minor conditions, Dr. Kalimov said, leering from behind a stump. The flesh of his face hung loose as if it were a badly slipping mask. His eyes were misaligned, his mouth a bleeding black slash that extended to his ears. He had no teeth. You're a virile lad. Be certain to spawn oodles and oodles of babies. I must insist on that point. We'll be observing, so... Do your best, my boy. There is also the matter of your firstborn. Miller had nearly pissed himself at Dr. Kalamar's reappearance. He forced his throat to work. You're asking for my child. Dr. Kalamar chuckled and drummed his claws on the wood. No, Mr. Miller. I jest. Although those wicked old fairy tales are jolly good fun, speaking such primordial truths as they do, be well, be fruitful, he scuttled backward, and then lifted vertically into the shadows, a spider ascending his thread, and was gone. Years later, Miller married a girl from California, and settled in a small farming town. He worked as a gunsmith. His wife gave birth to a boy. After the baby arrived, he'd often lie awake at night and listen to the house settle and the mice scratch in the cupboards. When the baby cried, Miller's wife would go into the nursery and soothe him with a lullaby. Miller strained to hear the words, for it was the deep silences that unnerved him and caused his heart to race. There was a willow tree in the yard. It cast a shadow through the window. As his wife crooned to the baby in the nursery, Miller watched the shadow branches ripple upon the dull, white oval of wall. On the bad nights, the branches twitched and narrowed and writhed like tendrils, worming their way through fissures in the plaster toward the bed and his sweating, paralyzed form. One morning he went to the shed and fetched an axe and chopped the tree down. The first tree he'd felled since his youth. The willow was very old and very large, and the job lasted until lunchtime. The center was semi-rotten and hollow, and when the tree crashed to earth, the bowl partially split and gushed pulp. Something heavy and multi-segmented shifted and retracted inside the trunk. Water gurgled from the wound with a wheeze that almost sounded like someone muttering his name. He dumped kerosene over everything and struck a match. The neighbors gathered and watched the blaze, and though they gossiped among themselves, no one said a word to him. There'd been rumors. His wife came to the door with the baby in her arms. Her expression was that of a person who'd witnessed a dark miracle and knew not how to reconcile the fear and wonder of the revelation. 
Miller stood in the billowing smoke, leaning on his axe, eyes reflecting the lights of hell. This has been an Audible Inc. production of The Book of Cthulhu, Tales Inspired by H.P. Lovecraft, edited by Ross E. Lockhart, narrated by Fleet Cooper and Teresa DeBerry, producer Mike Charzik, copyright 2011 by Ross E. Lockhart, production copyright 2013 by Audible Inc. Audible hopes you have enjoyed this program.